We're going to continue our study in Romans. Look at verse number two today, Lord willing. Romans chapter one, verse number two. Here Paul inserts a parenthetical statement, which he, he does very commonly, sometimes taking up paragraphs for it. But here he writes, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Amen. He's referring back to the, the gospel of God at the end of verse 1 there. How he said he was separated from the gospel of God. And then he, Tells us that this gospel had been promised before by his prophets, as God's prophets in the Holy Scriptures. We like to look at this gospel just a little bit briefly. When he says first that he had, I guess first we need to examine what is the gospel. There's lots of things that people call the gospel, but yet. Just by definition, the word gospel means good tidings or good news. Mm -hmm. But in particular, we're speaking of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I was reminded of this modern translation. It's called good news for modern man. But yeah. <laughs> yes, the good news, if you will, the gospel has been for all of mankind, not just one man. man. But I think Paul clearly defines what the gospel is over in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll turn there in just a moment. Just a few verses later here in Romans 1, he describes it as the power of God and the salvation. Amen. It is the means by which God uses to save souls. It is the gospel, of the, in particular the preaching of the gospel. He doesn't save by works, he doesn't save by false gospels, but by his gospel. Amen. I'll turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and read the first few verses. I'm sure we're all somewhat familiar with these. But as I uh, look around on the internet, in particular social media, I'm sometimes taken aback by what passes off as Christianity and right. what people equate the gospel to. Yeah. But the Bible is very clear. Here, 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses, Paul summarizes what we would call the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I do, or I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Amen. Amen. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. That is, in a nutshell, the Holy Gospel. Amen. Many people will try to add things to that and take things away from it, but it's really that simple. It has. A man can't comprehend. Just that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day. Yeah. Oh, so Paul writing over to the Galatians, as I believe it is, he says that if any other preach another gospel, though they be an angel from heaven, let them be accursed. That's right. That is the importance of understanding what the biblical gospel is. Amen. I saw an ad for a book the other day, a few weeks ago. Just, this is one example of things that just blow my mind that people even think this is garbage. It said, it says the UFO that took Jesus and who he really was. Oh my goodness. Yet there are people out there that take such foolishness and believe it is true. Right. So we we could expand upon the gospel and look at really the whole life of Christ, all of it pointed to 
who he was and what he was to do and how he fulfilled the scriptures. You have to bring it all down to the simplest form is that Christ died and was buried and rose again. Amen. And really that's still the same means by which God saves souls today. Not by these not by entertainment, not by good works, not by any of the other things, but simply by the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation. But we notice here in First Corinthians, as back in our text, that it says that these things were done as according to the scriptures. That, as he says back in our text, that they were promised before or before by his prophets and the holy scriptures. Mm -hmm. That all these things were already written before time, before Christ came. That the prophets pointed to him, that the law pointed to him, that the promises of the Old Testament all pointed to Christ and to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, not to get ahead of myself, but we do ourselves a disservice if we ignore the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, we see the first prophecy in that. We can turn there and we'll read a few places where Christ is clearly prophesied. Genesis 3.15 after Adam and Eve had sinned and the curse was being pronounced upon them. And verse 15, speaking of the, to the serpent, he, is, he says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, certainly, Adam and Eve didn't know that there would be a man named Jesus come some thousand years later. But yet here we see that one day Christ would come and he would says, bruise the head of Satan. Amen. Yeah, really defeat Satan. And Satan himself it says he would bruise the heel of Christ. He would, but he would not kill him. He would not right. mortally defeat him. Amen. We'll begin all the way back to the first two, we see prophecies of Christ and his death. Prophecies of what we would call the gospel. Well, Adam and Eve had it just as much as we do, and we have a lot more details. And we look back to it, and unlike the Old Testament saints, we look forward to it. We get, they knew of what we call the gospel. We turn over to Isaiah, we know the most familiar verses, Isaiah will begin at the end of chapter 52. A lot of reading, but I always think it's good for God's people to reflect on this passage of scripture. Amen. Here we see the, the sufferings of Christ described as well as sacrificial death for our sins. Beginning in verse number 13 of Isaiah 52, on through the end of chapter 53, he writes, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astounded at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Mm -hmm. He was so, he suffered so really, so beaten and so bloody that he couldn't even recognize him. He says his visage was so marred more than any man. Is more and more than sons of men. So shall he sprinkle, verse 15, many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, to whom mm -hmm. is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no corn nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Well, apparently Christ was not the finest looking of gentlemen. Right. But yet, his beauty is not in his physical appearance. Amen. Verse 3, he goes on to say, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. 
who very literally he was despised and rejected by his own people. Right. And to really today he's despised and rejected by all those who are not believers, and even many who profess to believe despise the true Jesus. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say, Surely he hath borne our caprice and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Steve, it wasn't for any of his doing, but it says for our transgressions he was wounded, for our iniquities he was bruised, it was the chastisement of our peace that was upon him. Then going the other way, it says, with his strike, we are healed. Amen. Amen. Christ's suffering and death was completely due to our sin, not for any wrong that he had done. Any good that we received was because of his goodness, not because of anything in and of ourselves. Amen. Going on, verse 6, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Amen. Even though all of our sins were laid upon him, he didn't complain about it. And we know he he didn't look forward to the suffering, I don't think. He didn't look forward to being separated from the fellowship that he'd always enjoyed with the Father. But yet he didn't oppose it. He didn't. Right. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He, he didn't fight back when they came to arrest him. He didn't try to escape when he was in prison, when he was being led to the cross. Amen. And for the, Hebrew says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. <clears throat> that joy was that he would redeem unto himself his people. Going on verse 8, he says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare a generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Amen. You should notice this reoccurring theme here that it was for our transgressions. <laughs> That he was cut off, that he was stricken. Verse nine he says, and he might, and he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, and there was any deceit in his mouth. And we see that fulfilled in Christ when he was taken by Joseph of Arimathea and buried in his tomb. In that, but it was only a borrowed for a little while, as we'll see here shortly. Going on in verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when he shall, excuse me, when thou shalt make his soul knock him for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, he shall be satisfied. Amen. Only Christ could satisfy the, the demands of a righteous God. You're right. Romans will bring it out very clearly that the law could not satisfy those demands. He goes on to say, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Be through Christ we can be justified. Amen. That is part of the gospel. That we, In Christ we have no more condemnation. In Christ we have justification. Because he died for our sins. Verse 12, we conclude here, it says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul in death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession, intercession for the transgressors. And he made intercession for us on the cross, and I believe Hebrews tells us he is still making intercession for us today. Amen. No Christ suffered and died for our sins. And that is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Not that he suffered and died, but we might make the right decision. Amen. No way. When he 
died for our sins, he washed them away for all of eternity. I can't remember exactly how Spurgeon once said this, but he said that if God laid upon laid our sins upon Christ, it must be that he would never lay them on us ever again. Amen. Mm -hmm. What a blessed thought it is that Christ would take upon our sins and they would be removed completely from us. Yet, so this wasn't some New Testament idea. We see it written very plainly here in the book of Isaiah. Amen. We can go back to or over, I guess, to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. This is good. <clears throat> Daniel's a little more figurative in his language here, but. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. And he had received the vision about the 70 weeks, and here Gabriel came and to make known to him the meaning of the vision. And Gabriel speaking here, and it says, At the beginning, verse 23, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, they shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and under the end of the war desolations are determined. Amen. You see here that really the prediction of Christ, or as he called here Messiah, he shall be cut off, he says in verse 26, but not for himself, not for anything that he had done, but for God's people. Verse 24 says that he would finish the transgression, make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. This is the redemptive work of Christ, that he would redeem us from our sins and would impute unto us his righteousness. And yet Daniel knew about in his day that all we could look at numerous types and prophecies that point to Christ. The Psalms are full of them. One of them, Psalm 16, verse 10, says, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Amen. That it is at least in type speaking of Christ and his resurrection, the apostle would reference that. When they were preaching on the resurrection in the book of Acts, that Christ would not stay in the belly of the earth, but rather he would rise again. And he did not. I don't know that he literally went down to what we think of as hell, but he went down to that place called paradise and took his people with him. He went and preached deliverance to the captives. He went, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly if they were how it all worked out, but I think he took them back to, to glory with him. Amen. Another type we see in the Old Testament is in really the story of Jonah and the whale. Matthew 12, 40, Christ said that there shall be no sign given except the sign of Jonah. Right. If Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Mm-hmm. We can turn over to Jonah for just a moment. I know we're all familiar with the story, but if you notice in verse 17 of chapter 1, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amen. Been going on 
the end of chapter 2, verse 10, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Amen. This was a type of Christ's burial and resurrection. He would be three days and three nights, and then he would rise again. He, all the scripture pointed to Christ and his coming, pointed to really the gospel itself. And yet, the Jews, and man, even still today, is too blind to see where right. these things. But we see him back in our text that Paul says that these things were promised by the Holy Scriptures. And we know that God's word, or excuse me, his promises are sure that they will come to pass. And they mad. Second Corinthians 2 20 says all his promises are yea and amen. You can be sure when God promised something, it will happen. Maybe not the way we think it should or when it should, but just as he promised Christ was coming, he has promised that he will come again. We can be sure that he will come again. I want to look at one more thing back in our text before we close this verse out. He says, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Take note that Paul recognizes them as the Holy Scriptures. Amen. Referring to the Old Testament writings, they were not just some laws of men or some good ideas that Moses had come up with, or they were the very holy scriptures. Amen. They were pure and sacred, is what holy means. You're right. And over in chapter 15, verse 4, Paul writes that the things which were written four times were written for our learning. <clears throat> we cannot discount the Old Testament. Everything in there is for our learning. You're right. And the more I study, the more I see how it points to Christ, first and foremost, and how a lot of it is really not any different than the Israelites. When I preached over in Eddieville last week, up to 1 Corinthians 10, Paul, in that particular passage, he brings out the sins of Israel and how they were for our examples. Amen. So we... We are not that much different than Israel. We are prone to follow sin and prone yeah, to doubt God and prone to complain. We're prone to do the exact same things they did. And yet, I think sometimes we look at those accounts and say, well, they were pretty foolish, weren't they? No. <laughs> we're not much better than them. You're right. One more place and we'll close in 2 Timothy chapter 3. <laughs> Not only is the Old Testament or the, the scriptures, as Paul calls them, good for our learning. Here he tells Timothy that they can even point one to salvation. Second Timothy 3, verse 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation. Amen. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Of course, I think we all know verse 16 says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for direction, for instruction, and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, excuse me, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and all good works. Amen. But even the Old Testament scriptures can point one to Christ. Amen. Point one to salvation. And that is what the early church preached out of the Old Testament. Amen. See the Ethiopian ring. Excuse me, this Ethiopian Enoch was reading out of that passage in Isaiah 53. Amen. The Lord saved him. Well, if you think there's no Christ in the Old Testament, you haven't studied it very hard. You're right. Well, the, the Holy Scriptures, as they're called, they all point to Christ and to the Gospel. It's been promised ever since the first sin in the garden. Yeah, we have the blessed privilege of having seen it fulfilled and being able to read the accounts of it. Amen. We have the privilege of being able to look back upon it by faith. We don't be deceived in thinking that the Old Testament saints couldn't look forward to it in faith. The Lord will we'll look a little bit next week in verse 3. And the subject of the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Cool. It wasn't just that any man had to die, it was that the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to be the one to die. Right. Not just anyone could fulfill the prophecies and the types. It had to be the perfect, sinless Son of God. So we'll, we'll touch on that some next week. Amen. Close with that.